Dust rush the backyard. That one wobbled him. This is Quentin Rampage Jackson. Drops him. This is Frankie the Answer Edgar. Hey, this is Rashad Evans, and you listen to MMA Fight Corner. And here we go. This is a championship fight. This is MMA Fight Corner, live on Fox Sports Radio with your hosts, Billy Bura, Phil Devine, and Joey Varner. Hey, this is Mike Goldberg, voice of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and you are listening to the MMA Fight Corner. Here we go! Here we go! go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to MMA Fight Corner. We are live from Fox Sports 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, Dr. Richard Rothman of LASIK in Nevada. He is the specialist to go to for your LASIK procedures. Call 702-636-2010. Mention you heard it on MMA Fight Corner and receive an additional discount. Guys, before we get into today's show, I'd like to take a moment and recap what we discussed last week. On our last show Friday, when we left you, we were talking about the landscape of the featherweight division. We had an interview with rising 145-pounder Marcus Brimage, who's taking on Conor McGregor this Saturday at UFC and Fuel 9. We also talked about some of the most bizarre moments in UFC history and previewed UFC 160. We had an interview also with Bigfoot Silva and Junior Dos Santos. If you missed any of those interviews, you can catch them on our iTunes at MMA Fight Corner. Also on YouTube at TheMMAFightCorner.com. Coming up today, we're uh, not pulling any April Fools on you, but there is that possibility that the UFC on Fuel TV 9 card could have a hiccup in it. It could be in jeopardy. We'll get into that in a moment. Also coming up, we have UFC middleweight Tom Lawler joining us. He'll be talking about his upcoming fight on UFC on Fuel TV 9. We'll take a moment here to talk about uh, GSP, what's coming up with his future, and we'll bring you the latest news and take you back in time with This Week in MMA History. But first, guys, uh, we have to get into what's going down with the fuel card here in Stockholm. <clears throat> this Saturday, we're less than a week out, and there's a possibility that Gustafson could be out. Yeah, man, the rumor, the Sunday, day before April's full day, the rumor mill started going full steam ahead. Uh, the word coming out of Gustafson's camp was that he suffered a cut over the eyebrow. He had to go to the doctor, and that the Swedish Athletic Commission wasn't going to let him fight. Um, a lot of people started speculating, of course, because it was the day before April Fool's Day, whether or not maybe in Sweden, it was actually April 1st, so this was an April Fool's Day joke, but it's not a joke. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are rallying, you know, uh, t t to have this fight on the card, you know, panicking on whether or not it's going to get pulled or not. Uh, Dana White since then has come out and said, no, uh, uh, Gustafson's okay, the fight still will go down. But um, there's st it's it's it's, uh, it's on shaky legs. Definitely on shaky legs. And I I'll tell you, when I saw that yesterday, I was scared, very scared. Um, hopefully, though, the cut doesn't affect the fight it does take place it's a fight we've wanted to see i think it really pulls that card together as a main event i just i hope it comes down yeah you know that's one of the scary things is, is the term that was floating around the forums was top heavy this card is very top heavy meaning that the the main event is is really what the selling point of this card is and especially taking place in sweden this is this is the hometown this is home turf for alexander gustafsson uh this guy is a rising star in the division but especially in sweden and for swedish mma they've really been building this card around him there's posters of him all over town the whole event sold out in an hour to lose him on this card at this late stage in the game could really be detrimental um first of all it's not one of the situations where you can just bump the co-main event to the main event because as much as Ryan Couture and Ross Pearson is an amazing fight that we're all excited to see and we, we think it's going to be a great scrap, it's just not solid enough name power to be a main event fight. And there's really no one on the card name-wise that can... can can anchor this or, or, or could be a main event fight. Um, and then at such late stage in the game, who do you bring over if Gustin is out? To, 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 if you can't find a replacement fight to bump to the main event, there's no one strong enough. You have to find a fighter to fill in against Musasi. Who do you do this? Who, who do you have stand in at such late stage in the game? Yeah, what's really funny is when uh, the, the Twitter, uh, let's say, universe the, uh, last night was absolutely going insane. Like you said, people lobbying for the fight. We have Tom Lawler on. The first thing he said, you know, he want he a middleweight is lobbying for the fight. I even heard last night, you know, rumors is like Hector Lombard. I mean, they, uh. they it was a, yeah. And it's one of those things you click the link. It says April Fools, but that, that's the worst thing. Is like the day before April Fools, right? Some something like this comes out. Are we getting but, trolled? Ex but yeah. The, the one thing we really need to start actually questioning is why are we questioning news that we hear on the internet 
on April Fools only. The, the internet, in all honesty, you really can't trust what you read. So I don't know why today is any different than it should be. Wait the rest a of minute, the Phil. I thought if you it read it on the internet, it might it has, has to, to be, be true. true. <laughs> That's what I heard, but apparently it's not. You know what <laughs> name that I saw floating around there a couple different times, and a person that I could really see doing this, stepping up, just be a, because of his nature. He's a step up kind of guy. He's a company man. I could really see see doing this, stepping up, trying to take this fight, and still making his fight would be Chael Sonnen. Yeah, wow. but Ch Chael's a little busy at the end of the month. But uh, I would love to see it. I mean, he he, he is, he is, and I, I don't think that would happen. They're not going to pull him off the main event. But another one floating around there, and I know he's just getting into camp for a fight right now that I thought would be interesting, especially considering who Gustafson's last loss was to was Phil Davis. Yeah. I had heard that floating around that they were going to do that. And Vinny's like, no, he's mine. And Vinny Magalhaes, he was yeah. like, no way, don't pull him. Yeah, I can't wait for that that fight, too, Phil and, uh, and Vinny. That Wrestling was, meets jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and, and that was a, a big th you know discussion that came out last week also. I mean, we didn't really get to touch on it on the show, but Phil Davis did an interview where he talked about how wrestling is the absolute most superior background in mixed martial arts. And Vinny wants to be the guy to prove him wrong. We shall see. Yeah, looking forward to it. That's definitely going to be a tough fight. Um, there were a lot of rumors with this in regards to Alexander Gustafson. Will he be in? Will he be out? One of the things that interested me most about it was the fact that they had some doctors check it out from the Swedish uh, Mixed Martial Arts Federation and that they saw him in photos. And two of the doctors said by the photos that they didn't think he'd be cleared, that there was a slim percentage, that it could be three to four weeks before the type of laceration that he has over his eyes heals. What do you guys think about the process that was being used? Will they actually examine him in person? Nah, it's I Photoshopped. Mean, right. It's Photoshopped. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're going to have to, that's the thing, is, is the, the, the commission and the doctors at hand, they can't make any actual judgment or assessment based on just a photo. They're going to have to go and take a look at him and actually do a physical inspection of the cut. And within, you know, 24, 36, six to 48 hours a lot of time that gives the cut a lot of time to, to heal um, especially if you if you attend to it right away you put some of the, the the what is it the adrenaline stuff they put on the cut you put some of that new skin stuff the super glue you know within 48 hours uh, a cut can look night and day from from when it first got opened up so um, there will have to be an inspection and I'll tell you what Dana White do doesn't usually go back on his word when he usually says something it usually comes to fruition so when he reaches out tells Ariel Hawani hey this fight is going down I think that it's a good sign this fight is still going down yeah but i'll tell you what though if your name is gaygard musasi you got you got an infrared scope on that cut man you're going to go to town on that cut everything you do every punch you throw every knee every elbow is going to be aimed directly at that cut trying to open that bad boy back up and you got to wonder what kind of mental state he's in right now because yesterday even he tweeted to dana white hey i just got in and i'm hearing that gustason's out like please let me know what's going on. So, I mean, <laughs> hey, listen, if Dana says it's on, I got to think that it's on. Yeah, it's funny, though, is that, is that he has to tweet to find yeah. out. You know, you figure he'd just shoot a text, hey, boss, are uh, we still good? Mm -hmm. But he got to tweet. It was like Daniel Cormier the time that he found out that his uh, fight was canceled. With, was it was the November Strike card. Yeah. yeah, and he actually found out from the Internet. I and mean, that's just crazy the way that that can influence. But, but that just goes to show you that what you hear on the Internet is true. <laughs> Well, guys, we will definitely get into all of that and more, but we do have some news here to discuss with you also. Um, one of the topics we were talking about was GSP, and the, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, FC 154 Tumblr, we met Sumo Suave. He paid homage to Apollo Creed. And uh, guys, what do you think we can expect from him this time in Sweden? Uh, I don't know. To what what can't you? All I know is that he was a little upset this weekend because uh, last week uh, some fighter made an entrance in another event and he felt he was outdone. Uh -oh. Tom Lawler felt he was outdone last week. I'd like to see what he has planned for his entrance this weekend. Unfortunately, though, we never get to see it. We never get to see it. No, but that's always like, uh, you know, it's it's what goes into the mind of a madman. Absolutely. You know, I, I, that's one of the things I want to talk to him about. I want to talk to him about his his uh, uh, his his creative process and and how he how he comes up with these ideas. How you know how he really thinks about us. And, and when he does actually feel like he's outdone, you know. What's he going to do? Step it up then. Now, now, if you're outdone, you better step it up. So I want to know. I know he's not going to tell us, but I, I just kind of want to I want to get a glimpse into the methods behind his madness. Yeah, I'm looking forward. Last time we had Tom Lawler on the show, one of the he said one of the greatest things I've ever heard anyone say on our show. And he said the fact that he works for the UFC 
is pretty much just an excuse for him to legally street fight. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. You, you know, and one of the things that he said is, uh, you know, and I we talked about his entrances and, and how he, you know, the mindset he's in when coming out. And he's like, I don't think about the fight at all. I'm never nervous about a fight. I never think about what's going on in a fight because pretty much I know as I'm walking out that within the first round, the fight is probably going to end with either me getting knocked out or me knocking the guy out. You got to love that. You got to love that. And speaking of the end of fights, you know who actually said that, that there was rumors that, that, that if a certain fight happens, this could be the end of their fighting career. And that's uh, Faraz. Faraz the hobby trainer of GSP came out, and he said that if, if – and we'll talk about this a little later, though. He said that if GSP fights Johnny Hendricks, he can see him having multiple more fights moving forward in his career. But if GSP does elect to step up, meet the champ at a catchweight or any weight for that matter, and, and take on Anderson Silva in the promotion's super fight to end all super fights, that he thinks that that will be George's last fight. Uh, I hope not. I hope not. I know it has to come to an, an end eventually, but I don't want it to happen quite yet. We'll get back to all of that and more. Right now, you are listening to MMA Fight Corner live on Fox Sports 920 from the studios in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with more MMA Fight Corner. The MMA Fight Corner.
what are we doing there? This is MMA Fight Corner. All right, everybody, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I am Heidi Fang, and I am joined by Phil Devine and Joey Varner. We are coming to you live from the Fox Sports Studio in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. Right now on the phone, we have a special guest for you, UFC middleweight, filthy Tom Lawler. He's taking on Michael Kuyper at UFC on Fuel TV 9 in Stockholm, Sweden this weekend, Saturday, April 6th. Tom, how are you today? Hey, Tom, are you there? Yes. Oh, there you are. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Excellent. So welcome to the show, Tom. You've got to be uh, getting ready to head out to Sweden soon, right? I understand right now you're in the East Coast still? Yeah, yeah. I'm literally like about to be on my way to the airport. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, yesterday we saw something from you on Twitter that you were interested in taking on Gegard Mousasi should Alexander Gustafsson be out of the fight. Uh how, did you get any response from that from anybody with the UFC brass, or did you make any phone calls? No, I didn't get any response. Oh. <laughs> I got nothing. Uh, you know, they ha- I mean, they haven't made any announcement uh, regardless of um, regardless of the main event. So, I mean, I'm not expecting uh, not expecting to be thrown in there. But I, I mean, basically, I'll fight anyone. I mean, my pay uh, stays the same regardless of who I fight. So I figure. Hell, if they need somebody, I'll, I'll step up. But I really didn't expect it to happen. So, right. Well, that, that's what I love about you, Tom. You got that old school warrior mentality. I remember the last time you were on our show, you said the fact that you fight for the UFC is basically just a legal reason for you to street fight. Um, yeah. You know, like, did you when you look at this fight, moving? If you had to, let's just say, forget about the Cooper, the Kuiper fight for a second. If you yeah. were able to sit in there and take on Gegard Mousasi. You know, going into a foreign country and moving up a weight. Like, it doesn't matter. You just want to fight. Yeah, you know, uh, I, to be honest, I kind of miss uh, the days of freak show fights. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that, you know, me versus Musashi uh, would be a freak show fight, but I mean, it, it's at least a step in that direction uh, compared to fighting guys in my own weight class. So, uh, you know, I think uh, sometimes the entertainment aspect gets lost a little bit. In the sport, and uh, you know, if you take a look at the fight a couple weeks ago between uh, Rumble Johnson and Orlovsky, uh, that fight, you know, got probably more press than it would have if it was uh, each guy's fighting individually uh, in their own weight classes, just based on the fact that there's like an unknown factor of, well, this guy's moving up in weight and he's fighting, you know, a guy that's normally heavyweight. So I think stuff like that's really cool, and uh, yeah, I've been watching MMA so long that I kind of missed that. Yeah, d- definitely. And I, in fact, actually, I think. Uh... You know, when you look back at those days uh, of the UFC with the the open weight classes, the, no time limits, things like that. I mean, yeah, you can say freak show, but that was it was a real fight. Those were nasty days. Yeah, yeah, and it, I mean, it was really that really was kind of like a street fight because those guys had no clue uh, what they were getting into for the most part. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that that stuff was always fun to see. Obviously, the sport's a lot better off now than it was then. Uh, but, you know, every once in a while, a good free show fight is uh, pretty damn entertaining. Yeah, speaking of not knowing what you're getting into, you know, what about tape? Are you, are you one of those guys that watches tape on your opponent? Uh, I've, I've gone through both, uh, both strategies in the past. Um, I've watched a bunch of tape on guys and tried to pinpoint exactly what they're going to do. And then I've also not watched tape at all. And uh, right now I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, I watched the fights, Michael Kuyper's fights, uh, I think once, and um, came up with a game plan from there. I, I think a lot of it, guys get too bogged down, and, well, he could do this, he could do that, instead of just focusing on being 100% uh, 
um, based on their skills and going out there and doing what they can do. So uh, that's kind of the approach I'm taking for this fight. Yes. Uh, now back to your approach and, and on to your training. Where, what's training been like these last couple of weeks? Where are you training for this fight? I've seen on Twitter you've been kind of moving around. Um, I'm training at a few different places, but uh, in my hometown, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and I train at a jujitsu place uh, pretty regularly, about five times a week. Uh, and that's with Tim Burrell. Um He's got a great group of guys uh, doing jujitsu at his spot, and he's a uh, he's. I don't know what degree he is because he doesn't really care. Uh, but he's under Carlos Machado, um, and then also off that. Sorry, there seems to be some uh, commotion going on outside here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, also, uh, Joe Lozon's gym, uh, Lozon MMA, and then uh, Triforce MMA as well. Very interesting. Now, um, go ahead, Joey. No, yeah, I'm just interested in, in, in the style matchup between you and Michael Kuyper because, you know, you come originally from a wrestling background and, and you've really evolved your striking game. He comes from a judo background and he's really evolved his striking game. He's got a Dutch style of kickboxing, you know, with judo back and you've got, you know, your well-rounded striking with a wrestling background. How do you see this fight playing out? I mean, I know you love the standing bang, but you always have that wrestling in your back pocket. Is this one of those times that you're just going to kind of feel the fight out, go out there and see where it goes? Or, or do you see that you have a distinct advantage Advantage on the ground, you know, with the uh, with your wrestling game over his judo. Um, I don't think I have a distinct advantage on the ground. I think there's some like transitional. No, 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 that, Tom, uh, Tom, Tom. I, I gave you the. I said you have the advantage, not him. Well, no, I, no, I agree. That's, oh, okay, I, cool. I, that's what I said. Oh, I said, and I bad. said I don't think that's necessarily the case uh, as far as like I, I don't expect to like, take him down and hold him down for an entire round. Uh, he's very good at standing back up. Uh, once he gets taken down. So I think it's going to be somewhere, you know, in like a transitional period where the fight's going to be won and lost. Um, I don't think the striking is better than mine. And uh, I'm not so sure that, you know, my, my wrestling uh, my wrestling style lends itself to holding guys down for a long time. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think uh, it's going to be like a classic striker versus uh, wrestler matchup or anything like that. Do you think the crowd is going to play any role in this fight? I mean, he's not from Sweden, but he, he is from the Netherlands, which is five minutes away. Europe's only 10 miles long. So, uh, yep. you know, he probably will have a lot of family and friends there and, and will be the considered the hometown fighter. Um, so do you think the crowd will, will play into factor? And how, how, how well do you think you'll deal, do dealing with a, with a hostile crowd? Yeah, I don't think he's going to be the hometown fighter, to be honest. Uh, I fought, you know... My last fight against Francis Carmont, he lives in Montreal, and if you listened uh, to the audio from that broadcast, the crowd was pretty vocal um, after the decision was read. And, uh, you know, pretty much everywhere I go, I seem to have a pretty good fan base uh, just based on, you know, my personality and the lack thereof that most guys seem to have uh, during fight week. Yes, de- definitely your personality it sticks out. Yeah, I tell you what, too. You, I think you have a cult following because of your entrances. Your entrances, I mean, your fighting is definitely exciting, but but your entrances, like... Don't lie. <laughs> no, you need to lie to me. I love to see you fight, but I think I'm just as equally excited to see what your entrance is going to be and how you're going to show up at the weigh-ins. Yeah, uh, me too, pretty much. You know, I get excited for both of them. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess it would be better if, I was like a GSP and just dominated everybody or like Anderson Silva, but realistically that's not what's happening in my fight, so I have to find my own niche along the way. Well, speaking of, of your entrances, what goes through your, what's the thought process when putting together what you're going to do for your entrance? Uh, well, I actually, I have no clue what I'm doing for the uh, walkout for the fight yet, but I came up with a good weigh-in idea uh, last night, as I was laying in bed, so really, it just kind of—I don't know. It, you just gotta feel it. Like there's no uh, process that really works well. I found. Is it getting harder to keep? I mean, because I mean, you know, is it hard to outdo what you've already done? I mean, you come up with some epic, epic ones—the the just bleed guy, the Don Fry, the Art Jimerson, Art, Art Jimerson, uh, the Dan Hulk- Severin, yeah, the, uh, Dan Severin, the the Hulkamania. You know, I mean, those are some epic, epic entrances. Are you finding it a hard time to uh, uh, to outdo yourself? Yeah, absolutely. It's getting harder and harder each time. Uh, but really, I don't like go into each one going, oh, I need to outdo the last one because each person has like a different favorite uh, 
of their of mine whenever I talk to them. So, um, you know, different things ring out that are with different people. So I just try to find something that the hardcore fans are going to like and uh, go with it. Now, we were uh, going back to the Francis Carmont fight. That was a fight, like you said, you, the fans were very vocal about the thought that y you got robbed in the decision. How much do you think that loss had to had to do with where the fight took place? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, if you look at the judging panel for that fight, it probably was three American guys. Now, maybe they might have been swayed by, uh, you know, the crowd a little bit, I guess thinking that I was in the hometown of the guy, but uh, I don't know. I think it might have it, or more of it might have to do with the judging criteria, uh, per se, and the understanding of judges of the criteria. Because in my uh, unbiased opinion, um, you know, I thought I won the fight, and, like, basically he was on the defensive for most of the time. And in the, um, you know, the unified rules state that now defense is not a scoring criteria, and then it's uh, reward in itself. You know, so the fact that he basically just played defense the whole time, didn't mount a whole lot of offense, uh, and came out with a W, I, I think uh, speaks more to the, the understanding of the rules rather than the fact that it was in Montreal. He, it's almost he, he didn't fight to win. He fought to not lose, and he won doing that. And we see that a lot lately. We definitely do. All right, Tom. Tom. Yeah, and, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, well, listen, really quickly, we know you got to get ready to the airport and we got to get going, too. I got to throw out five really quick questions to you, and I want you to answer as quickly as possible. First thing that comes off the top of your head, all right? Okay. All right, where do you take a girl on a first date? Uh, <laughs> Burger King. <laughs> what was the last movie you saw? Uh, I, I don't even know. Uh, oh, actually, Wet Hot American Summer. Oh, an old one. Okay. Star Wars yeah, or right, Star Trek? Like yeah, two days ago. Nice. I'm Star, sorry? Star Wars or Star Trek? Um, Star Trek. Nice. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, uh, invisibility. Nice. All right. And last one on a hot dog: mustard or ketchup? Ooh, relish. Nice. <laughs> All right. Yeah, invisibility. You pervert. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I uh, knew it too. I knew it. You were like all oh, the girls' locker rooms. I will be in. <laughs> well, Tom, before we let you go, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. Do you have any sponsors that you'd like to take a minute to thank or tell fans where they can find you? Uh, no. I mean, I'd like to thank my AA sponsor, Spot uh, Scott Domrad, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much again for your time, and all the best of luck when you head over to Sweden for UFC on Fuel TV uh, Nine. All right. Thank you very much. Thank take you. care. All right, guys, that was an awesome five uh, quick questions there with Tom Lawler. I can't imagine any better answers than what he gave with the invisibility and the relish on the hot dog as opposed to mustard and or ketchup. Um, when we come back, we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the best moments in UFC history. Sorry, this week in MMA history. And we're going to bring you some of the latest out of George St. Pierre's camp and some choice words that John Jones has for Chael Sonnen. You're listening to MMA Fight Corner. We are live from Las Vegas at the Fox Sports 920 studios and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with more MMA Fight Corner. The MMA Fight Corner.
MMA Fight Corner. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I'm Heidi Fang, and I'm joined here by Phil Devine and Joey Varner. We are live from the Fox Sports 920 studios in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. Well, guys, Tom Lawler obviously was a great interview, as always. We don't know what we're going to expect for him on the walkouts, but, you know, we were talking about some of the best moments in MMA history that we had last week in the segment, some of the bizarre moments and things that have happened. A couple of guys that should have been on that list, to Tank Abbott, for sure, back in the day with his cheese graters, what was that, UFC 6, when he's uh, <laughs> taking um, Paul Valerian's face and he's, like, smashing it in and then punching him and putting it back in the cage. Yeah, Tank Abbott was definitely someone we sh- that should have been on the list. I know, uh, you know, and there were – there's mm-hmm. quite a few that should be on the list, and there's some that shouldn't have been on the list. T- Tank has multiple moments, in bizarre moments in mixed martial arts history, not just the Paul – Paul, Paul Varlin's uh, uh, face face rank yeah, cheese grater yeah. on the on the <laughs> fence, but remember uh, the John Matua, the infamous John Matua, he knocks him out, and John Matua is convulsing on the ground, and he does the old stiff arm back, and then uh, the the Carl Worsham where he hit him in the chin, and it looked like he broke the guy's neck. To, yeah, uh, he looked dead for sure. Dude, that was one of the nastiest things I've ever seen, and then. Um, and Remember, he tried to, to throw someone he, out. He tried to throw someone out of the cage. They actually had to raise oh, yeah. the, the level of the he cage, make it two up. feet higher, because he tried to throw someone out of the cage. And not, not only that, times that they've had to, you know, pull him off the bar stool to come and fight. You know, it's a totally different error. I mean, like we were talking about with Tom Lawler earlier, there are, um, you know, it's just a different error. You have guys back then that were. They weren't athletes. They were just straight up bad ass dudes you didn't want to mess with, you know. But uh, it's interesting that we talk about Tank Abbott and everything because we, we're starting this segment every Monday where we're going to be doing this week in MMA history, and this is quite possibly one of the biggest weeks in history uh, history recap that we've ever done. So many things seem to happen in April, and a lot of exciting things that I want to get to. Well, real, real quick too, with uh, with the most bizarre moments in the history of UFC, um, if you guys caught the show, hit us up on Twitter. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us what moments you thought were missing from that list. Um, what you think the most bizarre moments in history are uh, in the history of UFC, and, and with anything as we. Phil's about to do uh, this week in history. Hit us up on Twitter with this as well. Anything that you find or, or what your thoughts are in regards to uh, the, the things he talks about. And to do that, we are at Fight Corner on Twitter. And then Joey Varner is at Joey V MMA. Word. Phil Devine is at Filthy. That's P-H-I-L-T-H-Y Devine at, uh, on Twitter. And I'm Heidi Fang at Heidi Fang. Yeah, and uh, dude, hit us up. We will definitely get back to everybody. But So this week in UFC history, I'm going to go by day, okay? And today is April 1st. So April 1st, 2009, UFC Fight Night 18 took place in Nashville, Tennessee. That night, Martin Campman welcomed Carlos Condit to the UFC and handed the natural-born killer his first loss in three years, taking a split decision win. Ryan Bader also defeated Carmelo uh, Marrera in his first fight since winning Tough 8. And it was the last time that we saw the infamous Junie Browning inside the <laughs> octagon after he took a beating by Cole Miller. You know what's funny about Junie Browning is now every year on Tough, the Ultimate Fighter, people refer, oh, he's this season's Junie. Yeah. Uh, before Junie, it was Chris Lieben. They'd say, oh, he's this season's Chris <laughs> Lieben. And then, so there's like, there's uh, B, BJ before Junie and AJ after <laughs> Junie. <laughs> Absolutely. So now it's like, oh, this guy, he's this season's Junie. And thankfully, this season, the Ultimate Fighter is so op- awesome, it's Junie free. Yeah, no yeah, Junies. And, th- it. and a special thank you and a shout out to Cole Miller for uh, for gracing us with that and uh, taking him away from us because that was a. That, that, that guy did bring a bad name to the sport. You know what's crazy, though, is, is and if you follow Juni at all, you'll see that you know his life has been in turmoil. He had this whole thing in Thailand going on where he was assaulted, he was beat up, he was on the run from the cops, he almost got killed, almost died. I don't know what was going on, but it was just this bizarre story of just chaos that you can only think that only in Juni Browning's life could this stuff <laughs> be going on. But the thing that's the worst part about it is one-on-one by himself – He's cool, man. Like, he came to Couture's. He went in there to train, and everyone beforehand was kind of like, oh, my God, here comes Junie Browning. But then he comes in, and he's nice, and he's friendly, and, he, and he's a good part of the team, and he trains hard, and he's very polite to everyone. And it's like the person that you saw on the show, the person that you hear these stories about, and the person that you actually interact with and met aren't, aren't the same thing. So it's, it's just what happens, you know? And I, I honestly think a lot of times it has to do with the old uh, –
of Nick Diaz, but what 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 a what a you know statement by Nick Diaz announcing himself to the world, and then even bigger than that though, Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz, the fight we all waited for, and it was so funny because you heard these rumors be- building up to this. Tito Ortiz, you know, he, he he was supposed to fight Chuck. They were friends. Then they weren't friends. Chuck was the number one contender. And like three times in a row, Tito got hurt. Something happened. Tito hurt his back. He couldn't fight Chuck. He couldn't fight Chuck. And these rumors started circulating that Tito was ducking Chuck because when they did train together, Chuck used to beat him senseless. And, and a lot of people just were like, no way. Tito's going to demolish him the way Tito was doing was everyone at that time. But then Chuck just comes out and he says, nope, the rumors are true. Believe the hype. The Huntington bad boy goes to sleep. The Iceman was the man back then. And yeah, it's funny, to this day, Tito still protests that he got poked in the eye after uh, with one of those shots. And that's why he could, that he, he got, gotten, he got gotten, poked in the chin <laughs> <laughs> in a fist. Uh, also on April 2nd, 2006, Pride Bushido 10 took place in Japan. And it was the first fight since winning the 2005 Lightweight Grand Prix that Takanora Gomi uh, fought. And and he was submitted by Marcus Aurelio in the first round. It was a major upset, but what it wasn't was a title fight. It was the only official, and I official. put official in quotes because mm-hmm. of Nick Diaz loss, official loss Gomi has had in pride, and to this day he is their only lightweight champion. That is crazy. But you know what? It just goes back to those things with, with uh, non-title fights to me I think are the biggest joke. Absolutely. Because if you're the champ, every fight you have is a title fight. You, yep. You're you're representing this thing everywhere you go. You get a fight on the street. That is for the damn belt. <laughs> but you know what's even funny though is, is, is did you see the rematch? Yeah. Bro, he mauled Marcus Willen in the rematch. They had to pry him off and it was like they had to they were trying to contain a rabid dog. This guy was going nuts on Aurelio. And I think it was two, two fights later and that one was for the title and that's technically the only time Gomi ever defended that title because because no other fights were for the title. Uh, also April 2nd, UFC Fight Night 13 took place in Colorado. I was actually at this event. Kenny Florian stopped Joe Lozon in the second round with some, my new word, brutal. Brutal. <laughs> That's b- brutal and beautiful elbows in the main event. James Irvin knocked out Houston Alexander with an eight-second Superman punch. And Nate Diaz gave us highlight clip for the ages when he submitted Kurt Pellegrino. Now, it wasn't the submission so much. That was the highlight. It was the double flexing, double the middle finger to the camera. That will just stick out in my mind forever. But also that evening, that was also the very first fight between Gray Maynard and Frankie Edgar. And Maynard handed Edgar his very first professional loss that night. Was anybody we know in that corner? No, no, not I was that, not that, not that, that night. night. No. But Gray definitely, he dominated Frankie that night, man. He just, he just controlled them. And, it, you know, it's funny because you watch, the, you watch that fight, then you watch the second and third. And that fight, Gray came out and he wrestled him start yep. to finish. He yeah. used his wrestling. And the second and third, Gray wanted to get in a boxing match with him. You know, he really, he really liked his striking. He fell in love with the striking, which, which happens so many times to these great wrestlers. They forget that they're great wrestlers. They want to knock everyone out. They want to land the big punch. They get, they get addicted to the feeling of smashing chins. And they forget <laughs> that, hey, they can pick a guy up at any time and slam him on their head. Um, but, yeah, that was, that was a great fight. Which why Johnny Hendricks is such a refreshing guy because you saw – in his fight with Carlos Condit, he he wasn't able to knock him out, so he went back to, to his using wrestling. his wrestling roots to win the fight. And that, you know that's the perfect example of guys, you know, remembering or getting back to their roots after they've found that little sweet punch they have. Yeah, and you know what too, with that fight with the Johnny Hendricks and the Carlos Condit fight, it, it for me it wasn't so much that he remembered his wrestling that he just he 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 for the first time he took the step in becoming a more well-rounded mixed martial yep. arts because up until that point Johnny was either throwing big bombs trying to kill you or trying to take you down but that fight it was he was throwing big bombs you know cutting you off pursuing you relentlessly and aggressively with the punches until he was in range for the takedown and he transitioned to the takedown he was almost using his strikes to set up his takedowns really for the first time effectively and uh, I thought it was a turning point th- I think it was a turning point in the career of Johnny Hendricks I absolutely agree with you uh, I got a, dude, I got so many more of these, so I'm going to run through these. April 3rd, 2005, Pride Bushido 6 took place. Both Emilianko brothers were victorious in first round wins that night. Minowa Man submitted Gilbert Ivel in the very first round. Uh, also featured Paulo Fielo and the very first appearance in Pride of former UFC fighter Dennis Kang. And then those Dennis two Kang. would go on to fight later, like after that, Paulo Fielo and Dennis Kang. I think it went to a draw. I don't remember. Two, two, think two guys in Philo and Kang that just, um, you know, this is why for me, and it's like no matter what you do anywhere, 
it doesn't amount to anything unless you do it in the UFC. Because right. Paulo Fio at the time and Dennis King at one time were two of the most devastating middleweights in the world. Everyone talked about these guys are, you know, number one or number two, best middleweights in the world. And Dennis King, when he finally makes the UFC, he, he fizzles. He falters. He just didn't look great. He didn't look that good. He didn't look anything special. And, and Paulo Fio, here's a guy, I, I think he's, he, he's, he's uh, a couple candles short of a birthday cake, you know. <laughs> He's definitely off his meds. So he's, he's definitely off his meds. Uh, April fifth, two thousand seven, fight night night, uh, fight night nine. Joe Stevenson submitted Melvin Gillard in just twenty seven seconds in the main event. Melvin Gillard, actually, uh, I think I think he uh, he was out a little late that night partying because he yeah. tested positive for yeah. the old booger sugar. Yeah, mm -hmm. right after that. Uh, <laughs> who does who does some booger sugar before you get into a fight? That's not a good idea. I don't know. Playing with the devil's dandruff before you're gonna go the scrap. <laughs> Come uh, on, I haven't heard those. <laughs> April 5th, 2009, WBC 40, Miguel Torres versus Takei Mizugaki. Uh, Torres defended his WC Bantam weight championship that night. Uh, in his second ever U uh, WEC appearance, Ben Henderson knocked out Shane Roller in the first round. Joseph Benavidez, Dominic Cruz, and Anthony Gianquani were all also on the card and were victorious. April 6, 2006, UFC Fight Night 4 took place at the Hard Rock here in Vegas. Bonner beat Keith Jardine. Rashad Evans beat Sam Hoger. But most noteworthy that night, a 14-7-1 fighter by the name of Chael Sonnen <laughs> earned his very first UFC win that night when he beat Trevor Prangley. Uh, and uh, these last two, April 7th, both took place on this day, 1995, UFC 5, Return of the Beast, took place in North Carolina. Dan Severn won the UFC tournament that night, beating three different men. UFC 5 also featured the first super fight, where you had Hoist Gracie and Ken Shamrock fight to a 35-minute draw. Also, it was the first time that the UFC had used time limits in the tournament. The quarter and the semifinal rounds were only tw were 20 minutes. The finals were 30 minutes. And since time limits were involved, this was the very last event that featured the Gracies. Okay, so this is the crazy thing. First of all, we got to see the return of tournaments because that is the most, I mean, mixed martial arts is probably the, the most intense sport in the world, in the history of mankind. But the tournament style fighting in the same night, man, that is so intense. That's so hardcore. I want to see that again. But Ken Shamrock, Hoist Gracie, do you remember? This is old school MMA. This is when it was real, man. And I think if this, if this rule was allowed back in, it would reinvent the guard in mixed martial arts, or it, mm -hmm. it would it would take away the guard. Period. The headbutt. Do you remember Ken Ken Shamrock sitting there headbutting Hoist Gracie nonstop? I mean, this sport they call you know, UFC as real as it gets. That, my friends, is as real as it gets. When you mention headbutts, I think of Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie, and I think of Mark Kerr, two guys that just use those headbutts like there was. Like they, for the right reasons, but one one time, uh, remember uh, where it was illegal still. Pride, it was illegal in Pride. Vanderlei Silva, Guy Metzger, they're trading. Vanderlei standing headbutts Guy Metzger in the corner. That was awesome. And finally, guys, April seventh, two thousand seven, UFC sixty nine shootout took place in Houston, Texas, and it may go down as one of the biggest upsets in UFC history as Matt Sarah beat GSP by first round TKO to win the UFC welterweight title. Also that night, Josh Koscheck handed Diego Sanchez his very first loss. And Roger Huerta and Leonard Garcia took, probably had the most entertaining fight in the history of fighting. Made the co cover of Sports Illustrated. Absolutely. Right. Well, Matt Sarah may have beat GSP that time, but it didn't last long. His next fight at UFC 83, he lost the title in the rematch to GSP for the unification of the belt. But we will get into a little bit more about George St. Pierre when we come back from break. Right now, you are listening to MMA Fight Corner Live on Fox Sports Radio 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back with more MMA, MMA Fight
MMA Fight Corner. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I'm Heidi Fang, and we're joined here today with Joey Varner and Phil Devine in the Fox Sports Studios, 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. We were just talking about George St. Pierre and Matt Serra before the break, and there are some interesting news going on with George St. Pierre right now in the news. It could be the end of a long, lengthy, dominant reign in the UFC welterweight division. Joey, what did you uh, hear about George St. Pierre from Faraz Sahabi? So, yeah, what we touched on earlier is Faraz came out and he talked about the future of George St. Pierre. And there's a lot of options on the table for George uh, everywhere, both inside and outside yes. the cage. As he's he's making his Hollywood debut or, or re-debut uh, coming up in the, the uh, what's the movie he's in? Captain uh, America, America. America. 2, I am not, Soldier. I am not impressed by your options. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so Faraz is saying that, you know, should George... George decide to stay at welterweight, fight Johnny Hendricks, that he he has a few more fights, you know, many more fights to come in the future. But is it if he does elect to step up, do the super fight route against Anderson Silva, that this will be his last fight. That will be the last fight. And Jake Ellenberger, rising welterweight contender, he just came out and said, in his opinion, he thinks that George should step up, fight Anderson, and retire before he loses. He thinks it's the best option he has for him. And, and I'll tell you what, you know, um, I know Johnny Hendricks, you know, he really wants a shot at George, but I want to see the George Anderson. And a lot of fans, they're clamoring for the for, for the Anderson and, and John Jones fight, thinking Anderson is number one in the pound pound. Uh, John is number two. For me, I think George is number one pound for pound, and I think with the Anderson and George fight, it's about legacy. John Jones is a dominant force, but he's still a newbie. He's he's still in his infancy. You know, he's not been on a two year run. When we talk about George St. Pierre and Anderson Silva, we talk about guys who have cleaned out the division three or four more times over. They started as champ, watched guys make their debut in UFC, work their way to the ranks, earn a title champ, beat those guys, watch a new set of contenders make their debut, earn a earn a way to the top, and beat those guys. These guys have cleaned out the division multiple times for the two best in the world. More than that, Call me crazy. Call me anything. Just don't call me late for dinner. But <laughs> I, I think stylistically, man, I think George can beat Anderson Silva. See, he, here's the thing, mm-hmm. though, and, and this goes back to the uh, on Friday show we were talking about Chris Weidman, you know, possibly holding out on his contract till he gets the Anderson Silva fight because he or till he beats Anderson Silva is the way he looks at it. But we got to remember something, guys. It's Anderson Silva, okay? And, and I, I agree with you when it comes to the legacy. When you look at Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre, that fight, we've been talking about it for years. It, it is one of those fights where both guys have cleaned out everybody in their division. They've fought the best of the best, and it's only natural for them to fight, okay? But y- you go back to the John Jones, and you say John Jones is still a, kind of new in the sport and, and hasn't cleaned out the divisions and stuff. But if you look at what John Jones has done in the last year and a half, he had the greatest year in mixed martial arts history. When you look at what he did, winning the title, and that year, he, he I think he had four fights. Yep. He beat Bader, uh, Shogun, Machida, and who was and then was rampage, a rampage. Yeah. so he just like he, that was that's the greatest year in mixed martial arts those are all viable contenders okay and when you look at jo- uh, Anderson Silva has he fought the best of the best the 185 division was always kind of weak and it was one of those things where it was like he was he was kind of set up to win he didn't really have that stylistic nightmare to go against George St. Pierre against uh, Anderson Silva yes yeah, stylistically but i don't know if George can hold down Anderson. I think Anderson, if you look at it when it comes to weight, if George is going to take this fight to be his last, he's got to do it right. He's got to put the weight on, bulk up, because of the fact, if you look, Anderson Silva is a guy who fights light heavyweight also. He's cutting to make, uh, he cuts a lot of weight to make little weight, and he doesn't cut a lot of weight to make light heavyweight. George needs to put on that weight, or come fight night, I think Anderson's a good... 30 to 50 pounds heavier than him. No way. 30 to 40. No way. You know why? You know why? I'll say no way right now because Anderson walks around at 215 to 220. Yes. George St. Pierre walks around at 195 to 200. There's a 15, 20 pound discrepancy right now. And if they were to meet at 175 or 178, that means that George is going to come in fight night around 200, and Anderson will probably come around at 205. Nah, there's not going to be that. There's only you're saying a 30 pound weight discrepancy 20, right now. 20 to 30. No, no, 15 to 20. Right? There's a 15 to 20 pound right now. So fight night if they if it's at 178, and Anderson himself said he could fight at 170. I don't think the size is going to be that big a difference. Here's the thing though, George take down takes down and holds down 
bigger guys than Anderson Silva and better wrestlers. Rashad Evans. Rashad has gone on record saying George would take me down and control me and hold me down all the time. Rashad is bigger than bigger than Anderson, not longer, but weight wise bigger. He's also a better wrestler. So I, I think that, and, and when have we seen, I mean, I, I love Anderson. I think he is amazing. I, but I just think, when have we seen him have this amazing ability to get back to his feet from the bottom game? Well, you know, you we saw, haven't. We've never but, seen but him on bottom. You, but you've talked about it in the past. For the last, you know, couple of years, he's been training for what? For wrestlers. I'm with you on that. I'm with you. So, you know, I, I, and we saw round one against Chael. He got taken down immediately. Mm -hmm. And then what happened in round two? Chael went for the takedown and couldn't get him down. And you mean that's getting back off. this and then, move? And then Chael brain yeah. farted. But, you know, I, I think Anderson against GSP, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, I know you think GSP is pound for pound the best fighter in the world. I think Anderson Silva is pound for pound the best. That's why you, when it comes to pound for pound rankings, it's subjective. Like, I mean, it, it, you, you'll never know unless the fight takes place. And like you said earlier with old school, with guys that are the same weight class. When, they, you know, you have two guys that are the same weight going in, it takes away any advantages, I think. Well, let's talk about the other pound for pound best there. We have John Jones, and he's going to be fighting Chael Sonnen. And we have that coming up with UFC 159. John Jones, arguably, like you were saying, one of the best in the light heavyweight division. He's cleaned it out. But there's already some smack talk going on uh, with this <laughs> fight out of yeah. that camp. John, John Jones taking a page, the, the number two pound for pound best in the world, UFC light heavyweight champ. John Jones taking a page out of the book of Chael P. Sonnen. He goes on the offensive. And, guys, you can actually catch this interview. It's a great video clip on UFC.com right now. Um, but he actually, he has some very choice words for Chael Sonnen. He says, you know, Chael doesn't have heart. He questioned his ability to fight. He says he's a one-trick pony. And he says he's not just going to beat him. He's going to hurt him in devastating fashion. I mean, he had, he really went on the offensive. And it's, it's very uncharacteristic of John Jones to do this. And, it, and I'm wondering, is it John Jones just, he's fed up with Chael? He's annoyed? Or is Chael getting, getting under the skin, getting to the head of, of, of John Jones? I don't know. But yesterday, apparently, John Jones proposed to his girlfriend. Okay, and she accepted. And let me say something: planning or just planning an engagement four weeks out of a fight, popping the question. I don't even think he's taking Chael serious, and that's not a smart thing. He just for had him, a new baby girl too. Yeah, yeah. And, and for him to sit there and to go into, like you say, this uncharacteristic form, talking trash, taking a book out of Chael's book, uh, out of Ch you know Chael. I, I, it's it's not right. It, I think he is making a big mistake. I think he's making a big mistake. Chael Sonnen, yeah, listen, he's never had a win, uh, maybe one or two wins at 205 in the UFC. He's a middleweight going up in weight, all right? But he talked his way into a fight. He did it against Anderson Silva, and he proved a lot of naysayers wrong back then. He could do it again if John doesn't take him serious. Yeah, and, and, and you know what, though? I, I really I, I do think John is taking this serious because— John's a guy, and if you hear him talk, you can see that he's very self-assured, you know, and, and a lot of fans would use the word egotistical. Smug. <laughs> yeah, you know, but he, he, he loves himself, and he loves himself as the champ. He is the champ. He loves that belt. He wants that belt. He covets that belt. And I think that is his driving force. You know, he, he, he's, a, he's created identi an identity for himself as the champion. And I, I think that is something that he will not do anything to jeopardize. I think he's taking this fight 100% serious. I think, though, he's just training so hard. He's so motivated. And he thinks that he is that much better than Chael Sonnen. That Chael Sonnen is a one-trick pony, and that one trick that he does, John Jones does just as well. Well, it's like, it's like we said a few weeks ago. He, he tweeted out a month ago, I'm ha just starting training camp, and I already know how I'm winning this fight. All right, but you know what? We are a month away. It's April 1st, guys. We find out at the end of the month what happens with this one. I don't know if it was all the ultimate fighter hype that got under their skin that started all of this because they were together for that long, but we're going to have to see how it pans out. I can't wait for all the media calls to start when Chael starts really getting on his wrestling gangster vibe. We're going to see that all coming up very soon in the next coming weeks. But for now, guys, we've got to wrap up the show here. Again, thank you for listening to the MMA Fight Corner live from the Fox Sports 920 studios in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. And again, you can find us on at Fight Corner at Twitter, at Joey V MMA, at Filthy Divine, and at Heidi Fang on Twitter. Tune in Wednesday back here on UFC Radio. We'll be back at 5 p.m. Pacific. Make sure to tune in to UFCRadio.com. We are the MMA Fight Corner. The MMA Fight Corner.